Thank you, thank you, Sandy, thank you, faculty, students, and everybody for coming. Uh, I think this is probably the biggest audience I've had at USC, and I've been lecturing off and on, more off and on, for probably 50 years. And the first time I uh, was to three people, my PhD doctoral committee. <laughs> and I think there were only about a dozen uh, between faculty and graduate students. I doubt whether we were more than a dozen. So you've come a long, long way, <laughs> and need I say more? Uh, I will spin a tale for you of three, uh, uh, three outstanding mathematicians among the greatest brains of the 20th century, Markov, Wiener, and Shannon. And why did I pick them? Well, there is a progression, but mostly because they influenced my life and my career, and I will, will talk from that point of view. Uh, let's talk first about, oops, something jumped on me. <laughs> what does it say? Restart, Restart now. No, we'll do that later, much later. Okay. Okay. We'll start out talking about uh, the Russian mathematician Andrei Andreevich Markov. Uh, it means that his father was Andrei, Andrew Andrei, uh, as well as he and his son was also, who was also a, d a mathematician, not nearly as well known as his father. Uh, Chebyshev is also a name that should be well known to uh, many of you. Uh, back once upon a time, Chebyshev was learned by every electrical engineer who studied circuit theory, Chebyshev polynomials. Anyway, a great mathematician was his, he was, it was his teacher. And uh, Markov is best known for Markov chains, processes, sequences, whatever you want to call them. And I will have my own definition of what is what. Uh, also a very interesting character. He was, uh, uh, besides being a great mathematician, he was also uh, forward-looking politically. He sat in the second Duma. The Duma was a parliament. 
uh, which the Tsar Nicholas, I believe, or Alexander, one of the two, uh, finally agreed to in the early 20th century. And most interestingly, uh, the Romanovs, who were about to meet their end, uh, wanted to celebrate their 300th anniversary of their dynasty, 1613, Peter the Great, I guess. And uh, that so angered uh, Markov that he had his own celebration of the 200th anniversary of the Law of Large Numbers, which he felt was much more significant. And I think most of us would agree. All right, uh, as I said, there's interchangeable sometimes process sequences and chains, but the way we'll use it, or we will uh, apply it, the terminology, when it's continuous time and continuous state, uh, we'll call it a process, when it's discrete time, continuous state, a sequence, and if it's discrete time, discrete state, a chain, which uh, uh, applies uh, to, you know, coin flipping, for example, which is, of course, the most, uh, um, the most fundamental. Uh, so let's start with the hardest, namely continuous time, continuous state. And uh, uh, the paper was 1906. Uh, of course, he didn't call it a Markov uh, process. It wasn't until about 1922 that it appeared as a, uh, in a paper referencing a Markov, a 1906 paper and attributing the, the characteristic to him. And I, I haven't defined the characteristic yet, but I will in a moment. And the physicists, however, were the ones who latched onto it earliest and did some very elegant stuff, which applies to control as well as to communications signal processing and so forth. Uh, so what's a, what's a continuous Markov process? It's one for which the conditional probability of the present state, and the state in this case is just the value, uh, is, um, that is in this example, is uh, it, no matter how many previous values I give you all the way to perhaps an initial value, it only depends on the last value that I give you. And that's the definition of, of everything Markov. So it's memory, but very limited uh, one state memory. Uh, so uh, I first encountered uh, Markov theory when I was at JPL and playing with the phase lock loop. What's a phase lock loop? It's a, it's a device to synchronize uh, the uh, phase of an incoming carrier or a signal. And uh, it is pretty much fundamental in all digital communications as well as analog, but primarily today digital communications, you've got to synchronize before you can extract any data. So um, without going into great detail, the, uh, this is simply a model of the differential equation which describes the uh, phase lock loop. And all of these things have physical uh, uh, equivalents, but uh, the uh, Rather than going into the uh, electrical analog, let's look at a mechanical analog, a very simple pendulum. And if I write the, a, a first, well, it's a rather peculiar pendulum because it's massless. As you see, there's no second derivative. There's only a first derivative. So look upon it as a, uh, as a pendulum, but one that is not vertical, horizontal on a, um, on a uh, uh, table which is being uh, uh, f uh, driven, or th that is this massless, let's say, balloon, is being driven by a, uh, a physical force, uh, which could be just the wind, and a random force, the, the noises, these two Gaussian noises in the two dimensions. Uh, therefore, uh, this being a pendulum, the, uh, the equation of motion is just, uh, just that. And uh, what we're interested in in it, as well, of course, in the fundamental phase lock loop that we're modeling, is first of all, what is the phase error? Because that tells me the accuracy with which I'm uh, uh, synchronizing. And also, how often do I flip phase? 
do I go all the way around? Which in the pendulum um, uh, equivalent is just going a full 360 degrees. And if I look at a typical uh, uh, evolution of the, uh, of the probability density function of the phase, assuming it starts in perfect synchronization at time zero, uh, as time goes on, it'll spread out, it'll spread out more, and then you may get a flip of a, a full cycle in either direction. Uh, this, is pro this represents the case where there's no driving fo force. There's no, uh, that F is not there. It is simply the, uh, the random uh, noises that are causing the, uh, the uh, movement of the pendulum or of the face. So this is a temporal evolution. And what we really would like to know is in the steady state, what is, what is the distribution of the phase error? And also, how often do I get a phase flip? Because that's uh, a loss of lock. And um, these physicists I mentioned uh, developing on the Markov concept through something called the chapman kolmogorov equation devise some uh, fairly simple uh, differential, partial differential equation uh, involving uh, phase and time and called the Fokker-Planck equation. And this has become rather fundamental in the study of phase lock loops and synchronization. Uh, the two parameters A and B are actually the first, the first moment and the second moment of the uh, of the uh, uh, phase distribution, and uh, which in that simple case are easily derived. And uh, when you're, um, uh, and since we're interested in the steady state modulo two pi, in other words, let's ignore for the moment the um, the flips. Whenever a flip occurs, we just bring it back. Well, we uh, we accept it and say, now where am I relative to the, uh, to the uh, zero phase uh, error? And if I take the limit as uh, time goes to infinity, in other words, a steady state performance, I get a very simple expression, very elegant expression right here, uh, which looks sort of Gaussian, except it isn't, because as, uh, as alpha goes to zero, it simply becomes a flat. Uh, and also, it's, it's bounded by minus, uh, plus or minus 2 pi. Um, I thought I had been the first to derive this, but I was, uh, uh, I was scooped by a Russian named Tikhonov, <laughs> <laughs> who beat me by two years. However, I think I was the first to actually derive the, first, the uh, mean frequency of skipping cycles. In other words, the, uh, uh, the inverse Pa first passage time, where first passage means that I've gone through uh, 180 and come down a full cycle. Uh, and this comes out to a very simple expression. And the zeroth order Bessel function is approximately the exponential is for large alpha. Uh, alpha, by the way, is a signal to noise ratio, if I haven't said that already. Uh, and obviously, the larger, did I say that in the previous slide? No, I didn't. I should have. Oops. Getting ahead of myself. Hmm. OK. Uh, so uh, it's uh, exponential in uh, twice the signal-to-noise ratio. The higher the signal-to-noise ratio, the less frequent, of course, will I uh, skip cycles, and also the, the sharper the, uh, the distribution. So this is one application of um, the Markov's concept. Let's go on to the next one, and let's not restart. Oh, this is really a pain. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, the second mathematician uh, that in, in, it's hard to say that he followed in Markov's uh, footsteps, but uh, one evolution of his Wiener filtering is actually uh, strongly influenced by the Markov concept. Uh, so this was, of course, a genius who self, self-defined and really was, of course, but he uh, graduated from Tufts, I believe, at age 14 and got his PhD from Harvard at 18, uh, is uh, considered uh, uh, in the mathematical uh, literature and mathematical word, he, he's one of the pioneers in harmonic analysis, Brownian motion. And uh, in the uh, engineering world, at one time, he was known as the father of cybernetics, cybernetics being sort of uh, everything that we, all systems that we talk about nowadays. And his uh, best known work in the engineering literature is, of course, this extrapolation, interpolation, smoothing of stationary time series, also known as the Yellow Peril, because it was published with a yellow cover. And during the war, I think it was unclassified, unlike some other things uh, that came along. And uh, then after that, in his dotage, he wrote Ex Prodigy based on his early life, and I am a mathematician. And he was an icon and a, and a character around the MIT campus when I was an undergraduate. <laughs> that dates me. Um, so let's talk about uh, one version of Wiener filtering. Um, it is extracting a signal, which is a stochastic signal, in the presence of noise. And of course, all of this goes back to uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss. Uh, like almost all probability theory does. And uh, in, uh, in the 30s, uh, uh, and, and especially culminating with his uh, work during Second World War, oops, did it again. Uh, he um, he uh, brought forth the concept of Wiener filtering, which we'll talk about. Uh, Bode and the famous Shannon, we'll be spending more time on later, um, simplified the Wiener uh, uh, problem in 1950. Uh, Peter Swirling, who, is, who was a, uh, a well-known member of the uh, Los Angeles uh, system theory intelligentsia, uh, played a, a, a role which was not sufficiently recognized. And then, of course, Rudy Kalman in 1960 wrote a rather uh, classical paper which considerably expanded on the work of Wiener. Uh, and Tom Kylath at Stanford uh, interpreted it further. So what is the Wiener filtering model? It's all about extracting a, a signal from noise. In other words, we have a stochastic signal which it has a, a certain spectrum, uh, but is really uh, driven by white noise. Uh, and uh, this simply models the uh, transfer function, which generates a spectrum. And that's Z at this point. And the noise that's added is, is also IID Gaussian. And we have, therefore, a noisy output. And from it, we want to extract uh, the, uh, the input, the, the signal, uh, uh, which um, hopefully as accurately as possible and the criterion that's used is minimizing the mean square error between what is estimated and what is actually, uh, was actually transmitted through the noisy channel. Uh, now, it is obvious that this is a Wiener, I mean a Markov process, if 
what I've drawn here were scalars, because then you have that the, uh, the x, the, the uh, uh, symbol, that is, uh, this is a sequence, the k symbol depends on just the input and the previous uh, value. And of course, uh, the output depends on that and the, the additive noise. Uh, but if, on the other hand, what we're really interested in is a case where uh, you have the input driving a linear filter. Now, the linear filter could be continuous as well as discrete. And if it were continuous, these delays would re be replaced by integrals, in which case then you have a transfer function, which is uh, uh, in terms of uh, omega or frequency rather than, than delay. But we'll, we'll stick to the discrete for a very good reason. Uh, the really useful application of this theory is in the, uh, in the dis time discrete uh, uh, mode. So uh, uh, again here we have, we're generating a signal which is a stochastic signal which is simply a filtered version of white noise. U of D is a, uh, U of D is, is a polynomial. In other words, uh, e, uh, the uh, successive, where the terms of the successive inputs goes into here, uh, or you can look at it as a sequence. And then, uh, uh, is uh, through these delays and these uh, scalars, we have a feedback portion and a feed forward. The feedback gives us the polynomial of the uh, denominator of the transfer function. Here's the polynomial. And the feed forward is the numerator of that uh, transfer function. So the problem though, this, is, uh, this doesn't look Markov because the, uh, and of course to this then we're going to add noise. But uh, uh, the, um, it's not Markov because as you can see the, the nth value depends n not only on, uh, on the input and the last one but several previous to it. Well, the, the, the way out of, the way to make it Markov is just to consider it as a vector rather than uh, a sequence of scalars. And if we write uh, the uh, state as well as the input and output as vectors, so the state, in other words, the values uh, along that shift register uh, in this manner, then we can see that uh, the, the current value, uh, the, or the, yeah, the last value, is just uh, for the feed forward uh, feedback portion is just the uh, vector B, the vector of uh, scalars of the feedback portion uh, times all those uh, previous values, um, and all the others are simply, are simply themselves, because all, all I've got is xk minus 1 equals xk minus 1, xk minus 2 equals x minus, all the way down. And then, of course, you add the, uh, the driving force, which is the IID um, Gaussian noise right here. And as a result, we can then look, looking at it as a vector, if you can see the bottom of the screen here, uh, it becomes, you can see that it's, we're back to a Markov uh, sequence uh, or a Mar Markov state because the k value depends only on the k minus first plus the driving force at this time. Again, same thing, but now uh, I, uh, before I was just considering the feedback portion, the feed forward is taking uh, the, uh, the vector of states, 
uh, or the state vector and doing an inner product with the, uh, with the uh, multipliers which represent the numerator of the uh, transfer function. And so the kth output is uh, just that inner product of the a and the x's. Now, the real uh, contribution beyond Wiener was in recognizing that the model that we talked about can be made time varying. In other words, uh, these two uh, blocks, uh, this being a matrix and this being uh, just a vector, uh, can be varied from one instant to the next, uh, from one uh, state to the next. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, I don't want to do that. All right. And again, the same, uh, the same um, equations. Uh, but what is it we're looking for? Now that we've set up the problem, what we're looking for is, is to find the least mean square error estimate of x hat or z hat given, uh, given the output y. And, uh, uh, and uh, since the uh, inputs are Gaussian, uh, the, uh, the best mean square error uh, estimator is, uh, is in fact linear. And uh, the answer comes out to be very elegant. It says, let's take the model that we've just been talking about, the model for the generation of the signal, and uh, let's compare it with what's coming in. Because this, in a sense, is an estimate of the correct next value. Let's compare it with the actual next value. And the difference is called the innovation. The innovation is a concept that I think goes back to Kylath in uh, roughly the early 60s. And then put it through again and dry and continue to dry this. And what happens is that, and so we have in parallel, if you will, to the uh, generation uh, uh, equation for the, um, for the process, which was on the previous slide, we have the uh, estimation, the equation for the estimation was sometimes called the gain equation because the gain is, uh, is this quantity here. Uh, nu is the innovation and uh, uh, the estimate uh, is just, that should have a hat on it. Uh, z hat should be, is a times the x hat. Uh, now, in um, the actual equation for, for this gain, and that's, that's the, the hard part, <laughs> which I'm skipping, uh, is a function, of course, of a and b, of what the uh, uh, characteristics of the process are, and the mean square error. So you want, and there is a nonlinear recursion for the mean square error called the Riccati equation. And what's nice about it is that with this model, you not only minimize the mean square error, but as, uh, since it's time varying, it, it's varying. And as you go along, you can measure or you can estimate what your mean square error is. You can, you can determine what, what the mean square error. And typically, if the uh, process is, uh, is time invariant, if these are just constants, then what typically happens is that as you go along, the mean square error continues to decrease until you reach a steady state. But if it's time varying, then it depends on what happens here. Now, what's particularly interesting is that even though Wiener's original goal was to extract signal from noise, uh, 
you know, signal from a noisy signal. Uh, the real application has been uh, to uh, orbit determination, navigation, and trajectory determination. Because the equations are naturally the equations of motion. And they are typically time varying as well. Uh, and so uh, uh, you wind up, well, I mean, I would say this is the foundation of GPS. One of the, one of the tools used in global position uh, satellite. Um, so, uh, uh, and uh, as you go along, you can also determine the, the performance. Finally, let's talk about Claude Shannon. And here I have a, actually an evolution from, from what we've been talking about to uh, a more, more generally used uh, uh, application. Uh, Claude Shannon is the youngest of the three, also deceased la la last. Uh, he also was a genius uh, who among other things, for his uh, master's degree, um, established the, the uh, parallel of Boolean algebra for designing computers for combinatorial logic. Uh, he was ahead of his time because in his PhD in 1940, he, uh, he uh, wrote on the algebra of, th of uh, theoretical gen genetics or developed an algebra for theoretical genetics. But by far his most important work, which has influenced, I would say, all of communications, is the Mathematical Theory of Communication, published in 1948 in two, uh, two uh, successive uh, numbers of the Bell, uh, Bell System Technical Journal. Um, prior to that, during World War II, actually, he worked on cryptography, came up with a communication theory of, of cryptography, uh, which was classified and later was published in the open literature as the communication, as the, uh, I'm sorry, not the community, that should be mathematical theory, as uh, the mathematical theory of, of uh, secrecy systems. I've only given this talk twice, and I, this is the first time I caught it. So, this is. Uh, the piece de resistance in my mind, a discrete time, discrete uh, state, or in fact, finite state uh, Markov sequences, uh, which, uh, uh, which has strongly influenced and been influenced by, inf by Shannon information theory. So uh, the work I'll be talking about uh, will, of course, was uh, influenced by Shannon and more directly by Peter Elias a few years later. Uh, Jack Wozencraft, Robert Fano, all MIT characters. And then I came along and uh, a couple of other contributors over that uh, period. And uh, the, looking at the uh, block diagram that we're going to talk about, it's very similar to what we were talking about in continuous state. The only difference is now the states are discrete. In other words, the x's are plus and minus one with equal probability, typically. Doesn't have to be. And again, uh, we have a, uh, a state, a vector state, x's. Uh, and we have a, uh, uh, an output which is the inner product of scalars with uh, those uh, binary values. And, uh, and then we add noise. And now this is still continuous, but the state is discrete. I'll come to an application in a little bit. Uh, so, uh, you might ask, well, why don't we have the feedback portion? Because if we had the feedback portion, since what we get out here is continuous, it would come back in continuous and I'd no longer have discrete state. 
However, I don't think uh, in the application we'll be talking about it in a moment, it isn't too great a uh, drawback because in fact any feedback structure, uh, which is sometimes called an IIR, infinite impulse response, uh, can be modeled in a feed forward fashion. It just takes potentially an infinite number of states of, uh, of, of, yeah, of uh, states, uh, which however we also always can truncate because after a while it becomes insignificant. So, but sticking to this, where does this apply? Well, it applies to intersymbol interference. In other words, when a uh, signal is put through a filter which is relatively narrow band, uh, a, a uh, binary signal, of course, uh, what we find is that uh, the, what we have out is not only the present value, but also uh, various uh, copies of the previous values, uh, depending on, uh, on the nature of the, uh, of the filter. But in, in fact, many cases, if I put it, for example, through a one-stage RC filter, then it, the A's will be exponentially decreasing. So uh, what, again, though, the problem is the same. The difference is, though, that the state is uh, discrete. So here's the example, but I'm going to do it for the simplest possible case, where the intersymbol interference is only with the last uh, term. So, uh, and sometimes, in an example I will give you, you force it to be. And that's the case in magnetic recording. Uh, so we have a binary input. Uh, we call that current value the state xk. And the previous value, gone through the delay, xk minus 1. And that's the, the, the interference. That's the interfering value. It's still in the system. Um, so uh, what we can, the way we can model this quite elegantly, quite simply, is by a state diagram, saying that uh, if I, because what I have coming in are plus ones and minus ones. Uh, so what can happen is uh, the uh, the next one is also a plus. So the the previous one goes to x k minus one. Uh, and the new one is plus, so I stayed in that state. The state is just the last thing that happened. Or if the next one is a negative, I flip, and I'm now in the negative state. And similarly, if I'm in the negative state, the next one is positive. So this is about the simplest state diagram I can conceive of. And what I'm measuring, though, what I'm observing are the uh, noisy outputs. And I want to find the most likely sequence through the state diagram. In other words, uh, here's uh, the present, then I, it, it goes, it can either stay there or go to the next one and so forth. And this is rather, rather than just rotating around this state diagram, I can spread it out by just looking at it at successive times. And we call this a trellis because it looks like a tree, but it recombines. And I think in agricultural circles, that's called a trellis. So uh, if, if I s have a sequence of pluses, then I'm always staying in, in the top here. If I have a sequence of minuses, always down here. And then I flip from one to the other. So what I would like to know is what is, based on the observables, what's the most probable path through this trellis? Uh, that'll tell me, uh, that'll give me the, the best choice of what went in. Well, uh, given that the noise is Gaussian, then the success of prob the probability of what y is, given what the last, what the current and the last value were, is simply e to the minus y minus z, e to the minus y k minus z k, but zk is a xk minus 1 plus xk. So it's just this. And I'm taking the logarithm so I don't have to carry the exponential around. And I get 
a linear term in y and then a quadratic term in the x's. Now, uh, interestingly, uh, this um, um, uh, oh, taking the logarithm has another value. Uh, if I were to look for, for, the, for the, the best, the highest probability uh, of any given path, I'd have to take the products of all the probabilities. But by taking the logarithm, the logarithm of the product is just the sum of the logarithms. So now all I have to do is sum the log likelihood functions. Uh, to get a little more specific and a little more simplifying further, let me let a equal 1. No, let me come back. No, sorry. I'll do that a little later. Uh, let me carry this forward a little more and just uh, uh, note that since I want to maximize uh, this function, uh, it, uh, for, uh, for each one, uh, for each path, on whatever path I'm on, the yk itself uh, will be uh, the same. So for two different paths, yk, when I expand this quadratic, I'll have yk squared, which, will, uh, which uh, d doesn't differ in, in either of the paths or any of the paths. So I can forget about that quadratic and just take the linear term which is right here, uh, and uh, the, uh, the quadratic term here. Now, what we, to find the most likely, in other words, the one that maximizes the, the, the sum of the log like, find the path for which the sum of the log likelihoods is maximized, let me define for each branch we talk about a branch metric, and the branch metric is just the quantity I've just defined here. Uh, and the state metric, the state metric is the sum of all the branch metrics up to that given point. And we want to maximize the lock likelihood of the path up to, to say, node capital K. Well, it's pretty trivial to, to see the following recursion, that the uh, the state metric that is the best uh, way of arriving at a given node at time k is just the best, is just the, the, the value at the previous time at the plus, uh, plus, that is the state, the previous state, uh, plus the branch metric. And it, it can either come from here or from there. So it's either the state here, the upper, plus the branch here, or the state in the lower plus the branch here. So it's simply this recursion. And similarly, down below, it's the same thing, but with minuses instead of pluses. So. Let's now look at a very specific example, that of magnetic, rec well, uh, the most trivial form of magnetic recording, where you force uh, the interference for the simple purpose of eliminating DC bias. Because if you had all pluses, you would normally get a, uh, a, a spike at DC. So by by putting a minus one for that a, we uh, uh, then the successive pluses would give me zeros because it plus minus, and so that way I I eliminate the DC bias. Well, when that happens, uh, putting a, an a equal minus one, here's what the uh, the metric, the branch metric or log likelihood looks like, uh, and uh, uh, expanding that, what we find is that it's one of three different values. If xk equals xk minus 1, whether they're both positive or both negative, then uh, the uh, 
this term goes to zero, and this term also goes to zero, so we get zero. But if xk uh, and xk minus 1 are different signs, then you'll either get, if it depends on which is positive and which is negative, you'll either get 2yk minus 2 or minus 2yk minus 2. Well, keeping the 2s is useless. Because if I'm comparing things, uh, if I'm adding them up, if I have a multiple of 2 on everything, I might as well remove the multiple of 2. So let me divide through by 2 with no loss. And also, I can add an arbitrary value to anything. So if I divide by 2 and then add 1 to everything, then these go away. I just get yk and minus yk. And this becomes 1. So that's what I have here. That the metrics now become really simple. Uh, if it's uh, along the, if it's a plus to plus, it's a 1. If it's a minus to minus, it's a 1. But if it's a plus to minus, it's minus y. And if it's minus to plus, it's plus y. So this now is a trellis which is labeled by branch metrics, which are completely normalized, which I can do without any loss of, uh, of uh, information that I need to get the best path. And, uh, uh, and, and in fact, that is an application. Here's a, a wider application. A wider application is to convolutional coding. And convolutional coding, for a long time, was considered to be the, the best uh, chance for approaching the Shannon limit. Now, a version of it called TurboCodes has, in fact, nearly approached. But there's also a blocked version. So the issue of blocked versus convolutional is very unimportant anymore. Nevertheless, this made for some beautiful papers. And, uh, uh, when you look at this, it's the same thing as I've talked before. It's pluses and minus going in, except instead of two, uh, two I'm going from right to left because it's, it's simpler to draw the picture here. Uh, then uh, instead of just one delay element, I've got two, or I could have three, I could have four, and so forth. Well, with two delay elements, as you can see, obviously I have four states, plus, plus, minus, minus. I labeled the states here as starting in plus plus. Uh, if I want to stay in plus plus, then I just go around here. Uh, and then if I have a minus in here, then I have a plus followed by a minus. That's the new state, and so forth. So it's, I've got four states. If I had three uh, registered, I, uh, three delay elements, I'd have eight states, and on and on. And, on. and the decoding algorithm, that, that is the algorithm that uh, uh, determines the l most likely path is just b the same as before, except that now it's more generalized because uh, I've got more uh, transitions. Be before I could only go uh, straight, or uh, and now I can go. <laughs> You'll remember this lecture mostly because of this. Um, so, and, and uh, if you work through the, the Gaussian uh, expressions, you find that uh, if the inputs are equally likely to pl be plus and minus uh, one, then uh, the branch metrics just turn out to be uh, sums and differences of the, uh, of the y's out here. And, um, and by the way, it applies equally for an, a time-varying generator where, uh, by the way, I use plus and minus ones, and th therefore I've got multipliers. The more conventional is to talk about zeros and ones, and then these things become modulo two adders or exclusive ors. Um, so uh, as I said, this was one st this and the algorithm that went with it, it was one step in developing uh, the proof of a theorem. And the theorem was this. Uh, it, our, conventional, our convolutional code is superior to block codes. And the answer was, in terms of uh, the length, comparing constraint length, which is the length of the register, with the block length of a block code, uh, then uh, the uh, error probability, which is, can 
was shown by Shannon and Elias and many others to be exponentially decreasing in the length, whether it's, it's uh, block length or uh, shift register length. Um, and and, uh, and uh, the exponent uh, is a function of rate, where goes the rate is from zero to capacity. And for a block code, this is, of course, an an, uh, a, um, a limiting case of very noisy channels. Uh, the block code uh, looks like this. The convolutional code looks like that. So this was originally just attempting to prove that result and I mean, a lot of other stuff. But this is the simplest uh, expression of, of the theorem. Um, and uh, if we look at it from a Shannon uh, limit point of view, uh, looking at it as signal to noise uh, normalized by rate, which turns out to be just the bit energy per noise density. Uh, this blue line is the minimum signal to noise uh, that can be, that corresponds to capacity. The minimum signal to noise whereby you can get error probability that goes asymptotically to zero as the block or convolutional length goes to infinity. And along the x-axis, we have the bandwidth, the ratio of bandwidth to data rate. Uh, so for example, for the ratio of bandwidth to data rate of 1, that represents QPSK, where you're sending 2, two bits per, per cycle. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, that's a Shannon limit is 0 dB. And it comes from the, the classical capacity formula. Well. Uh, as I say, this is the limit. Uh, the uncoded, uh, if you don't use any information theory and just do as well as you can with the, uh, a digital demodulator, it takes about 10 and a half dB of signal to noise, or EB over N0, to achieve an error, one error in a million in a additive Gaussian channel. And on the other hand, with convolutional codes, which were the state of the art, about 10 years ago, uh, the, um, you cut that difference by about a factor of two in dB. So you went from 10 and a half to about four, four something dB. And since that time, by uh, improvements, turbo code and low density parity check code, we can come down probably to on the order of one dB. So there's, there's still another three dB to be gotten. But anyway, that was the state of the art in, the, in 1970. And that was, at that time, we didn't think that all of this could be done uh, practically, because Moore's law hadn't clicked in yet. So what we did was we built drawers of equipment. This was at my first company, Linkabit. And uh, in the mid-1970s, to uh, implement roughly what I just talked about. It took uh, oh, some three or 400 uh, circuits and a big circuit board and, and all that. And of course, by n a decade later, you could do it on, all in one chip. I think. Yeah. Uh, but uh, by the late 1960s, you had a single chip implementation. And by the uh, 90s, or so, it was all in a tiny fraction of a chip. And uh, typically, a system on a chip that implements a uh, cellular phone or a laptop, or well, a laptop, of course, but a, an iPod, an iPad, or what have you, is just almost invisible. So, but as I say, the original purpose of that work was to prove a theorem. It did make its way into uh, a fairly large number of devices, uh, both phones and satellite receivers. But the, uh, the same concept, which based on Markov chains, uh, had legs and went way further. Uh, optical character recognition oh, uh, was one uh, uh, minor application. Speech recognition was a much bigger one. Uh, it's, well, 
in, with optical characters, the branch metrics are uh, the sum of the character um, the relative uh, uh, frequency of characters and the transition between characters. In speech recognition, you deal with phonemes, but the general concept is the same, but it gets much, much more complicated, of course. Uh, search engines, DNA sequence and uh, uh, alignment, and many other things. But to address these applications, you're, you're dealing with what's called a hidden Markov process or a hidden Markov model. And uh, what that is, is a cloud. And behind that cloud is the Markov model. But if you open up the clouds, then you've got the Markov model. To do this, you need, there are s s different algorithms. Uh, one, uh, one of the most commonly used uh, is the Baum-Welch, Welch being Lloyd Welch, your own Lloyd Welch of the electrical engineering department. And um, uh, as I said, there are a number of applications. Now let me talk about a non -app well, let me just summarize by saying uh, that what I've talked about uh, Continuous time, continuous state, uh, very elegant but very limited. It's limited actually to first order systems. If you want to go to more than a first order system, you have to make approximations. Um, but it, it evolved, the evolution of the PDF is, is uh, revealing and quite interesting. Uh, in sequences, you have discrete time where discrete time, continuous state. You could also have uh, continuous time, uh, and it's, it's somewhat parallel, but with time varying applications, uh, that's, in my opinion, that's where it has really paid off. And uh, uh, it's ga optimum for Gaussian uh, uh, inputs with additive noise. And with chains or discrete time, discrete uh, s uh, state, we have a maximum likelihood estimator. For arbitrary nonlinear, doesn't have to be linear, can be time varying. All you need is the input and noise to be independent. And as I said, let me give you a non-application, and that is to society. <laughs> and the question is, does, does the Markov property apply uh, to long-term memory? Uh, and the answer that George Santayana gave is no because those who forget their history are doomed to repeat it. <laughs> but individuals, for some individuals it may work, not for societies. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you.